Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. So we are very pleased to welcome tonight Professor Eric Fossum. Uh, so everybody should be very grateful to him. I mean, say thank you because he's the one who made possible to take pictures everywhere uh, because he invented the, the CMOS image sensors uh, that, that makes uh, this, the technology for taking digital pictures miniaturized so you can, uh, you can have it in your cell phone everywhere and put pictures of your friends on Facebook and everything. So he's the one who made this possible and he's going to give you his, uh, his experience about this wonderful story tonight. So Professor Fossum started his career in the electrical engineering department in Columbia University. And then in 1990, he joined the Jet Propulsion Lab in Caltech, where he monitored the development of the CMOS active pixel sensors. He's also an entrepreneur, and he became a very active entrepreneur as a CEO of multiple high-tech and highly, successive company, uh, highly successful companies. And he is now a professor of engineering at Dartmouth. Uh, so he stays very close to innovation because he is there as the associate provost for entrepreneurship and technology transfer. Professor Fossum received many, many prestigious prizes. Uh, I will just cite the last one. So he is for 2017 the laureate of the Queen Elizabeth Prize. So this is one of the top honors uh, in science. So Let's welcome Professor Fossum for this keynote, for this closing keynote for the enrichment program for the spring 2017. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. And uh, let me just uh, say it's a great pleasure to uh, be here at KAUST. And uh, this is my first trip ever to uh, Saudi Arabia, and it's been uh, quite eye-opening and uh, quite an educational, positive educational experience. So I want to thank KAUST for uh, inviting me and for being such uh, great hosts. So uh, this talk is on, uh, well, as you can read, making every photon count in uh, digital cameras. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of break this talk into uh, three, well, there's kind of three parts. Um, but not necessarily in this order. So I thought being a university, I should give you some sort of extra learning in the basic science behind uh, image sensors. Um, so I'll kind of sprinkle that in. Uh, but really the first part will be on uh, CMOS image sensor technology, which is what each of you has in your uh, camera phone. And a lot of other places, I might add. Um, and then, um, the other or last part of the talk will be on what I'm doing today, which is this uh, quanta image sensor technology. And as I like to say, you know, if you go to a, uh, a music concert with an old musical artist, uh, you know, most people in the audience, they want to hear the old music. That's what they, wanna, they want the artist to play. The artist, on the other hand, is probably thinking, I'd like to play some of my new music because I've been playing the old music so long. So that's why there's a mix here between the CMOS image sensor stuff and then what I'm working on uh, today. So uh, please indulge me in that part. So part one, CMOS image sensors. Uh, so uh, first of all, this uh, technology enables uh, billions of cameras every year. And if you go to any sort of event, you see this kind of image all the time. It's just like everybody holding up their cell phone camera to uh, take pictures. Uh, in fact, uh, just recently I did a little research and uh, found out there's about, believe it or not, about six billion pictures uploaded to the internet every day today. Six billion. And if uh, I took this uh, published data and I put it on a log plot, and uh, what you see as a function of year is that the rate at which pictures are being uploaded is doubling about every year. So if that trend continues, by 2020, there'll be 100 billion photos uploaded every day, which is a lot of pictures per every person on the planet. It's, in fact, completely mind-boggling. I don't understand it, but that's it. <clears throat> So one of the things that uh, I was happy to learn in my visit to KAUST, because I went to the uh, Museum of uh, Science and Technology, uh, was that in fact um, the very first sort of camera, the camera obscura, 
uh, was conceived a thousand years ago. Also incredible. Um, so it has a long history. It didn't go advance too quickly, obviously. Um, but if we fast forward a thousand years later, uh, here's a picture of the photographer Ansel Adams. And you can see his portable camera here. He's got it mounted on top of his car. Uh, and he's taking a picture of the range of light. That was the name for the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, and of course, it also has the double meaning that there's a big range in photographic uh, exposure and light. So that was his mobile rig. And then today, you could just take your smartphone out and uh, take a quick picture of uh, Yosemite Valley if you wanted to. And that's just in a few years. So uh, here's some, uh, something technical. So uh, most light that we see comes from black body radiation of photons. So it's basically, as you know, something gets hot, it starts to glow red or, or white hot, depending upon the temperature. And the biggest source of that for us is our sun. Uh, and so uh, here's my dog <clears throat> watching the sunset on the lake. And uh, so that, uh, that light, which is something like 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 17th photons per square centimeter per second, uh, goes into the camera lens. It's gathered by the camera lens. And the electromagnetic waves of radiation are bent by the glass lenses and then go through to the uh, digital sensor, which is at the back end of the camera, and focus there. And there, the individual photons of light are uh, expose the uh, sensor. And of course, those electromagnetic waves come in many different wavelengths. The visible part that our eye is sensitive to is just a very uh, small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the color that we perceive is directly related to the wavelength of light um, from uh, blue all the way to red. So today we have many, many kinds of uh, digital cameras. Uh, Certainly the most prevalent one is the uh, cell phone camera. We call the killer app in, uh, for startup companies anyway. Um, but many other kinds of cameras, you can uh, see them here. The uh, one that's uh, over here is a uh, dental x-ray sensor. Uh, we were involved in that, but now uh, in that development. But now if you go to almost any dentist office, this is the way they take the x-rays of your teeth. Uh, this thing here in the middle is a pill camera that you swallow and the people that invented that concept came to us in the early days of our uh, startup company and asked us to make a sensor for them that would make this thing possible. Uh, there's also cameras in uh, cars, cameras used for motion capture and cameras used for all kinds of things, in fact. So, uh, the solid state image sensor, which is making something out of uh, silicon chip material, uh, actually can date back to 1966. Peter Noble in the UK uh, came up with this idea of the self-scanned uh, readout. Actually, it was a, uh, here's a small technical part of this. If you look at the diagram here, uh, it's actually what we would call an active pixel device. There's a photodiode that's light sensitive and it goes into a little amplifier circuit. Um, and so he built some small arrays of these things. Uh, but unfortunately, at that time, the semiconductor technology was actually kind of immature. So uh, even though he could make this device, it didn't work very well. Also, Gene Weckler, who was in the United States at Fairchild, uh, was basically doing the same thing at the same time. So I kind of consider that the zeroth generation of image sensors. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't really get into the commercial uh, world very quickly. And part of that was because the uh, charge couple device was invented in uh, 1969 at Bell Labs. And it didn't have that manufacturing uh, problem that uh, those early MOS sensors had. And a CCD, charge couple device, uh, operates by having a number of electrodes on the uh, surface of a semiconductor. And if you apply a voltage to the electrodes, uh, the electrons that are in the semiconductor kind of get dragged along underneath. I kind of think about it as if you had magnets on top of a glass table 
with filings underneath, iron filings underneath. And if you pulse the electromagnetics, electromagnets in sequence, the metal filings would be dragged along underneath the table to kind of follow the magnet that's on. And so that's kind of the way this uh, CCD device works. But you can imagine that if you want to move the filings, or in this case, electronic charge, from one place on the chip to another place, you have to repeat this pulsing process many, many times in order to get the signal out. And so if you build a uh, image sensor, you have to build um, kind of these uh, shift registers or uh, conveyor belts, if you want, uh, that shift charge vertically through the chip. And when the last row comes down to the edge of the chip, it gets transferred into another shift register, which shifts sideways at high speed, all the way out to an amplifier that's in the corner of the chip. So sometimes I like to think of this as, okay, let's say it was raining on a football field, and you wanted to measure how the rain was varying across the field. So you might think about, okay, we could just put thousands of people out on the field, each with a bucket, and they can hold the bucket under the rain. I hope this analogy works here. You guys know about rain, right? It's uh, so you, <laughs> oops, uh, so uh, anyway, you hold the bucket out under the rain for some period of time, and then uh, everybody says, okay, let's take the measurement, and so everybody starts doing a bucket brigade operation. You pour your contents into the bucket next to yours, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and finally, uh, your water gets passed down all the way to the corner of the field, where somebody has a measuring stick, and they, uh, they measure that, uh, bucket load, and I can work backwards to find out what the rainfall is. And you can imagine that if you're trying to make the measurement very quickly, it's very hard to pour this water accurately so many, perhaps thousands of times without losing a single drop. And uh, also it takes a lot of work to, to move all that water to the corner of the field. And the same thing is true in a semiconductor chip. It takes a lot of power uh, to move the charge to the corner of the chip, and it also, uh, has a possibility that you lose charge along the way. So these were kind of the drawbacks of the CCD. Nevertheless, it was a wonderful invention. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, so wonderful that in, nine, in 2009, uh, Willard Boyle and uh, George Smith, who were at Bell Labs, that invented this CCD concept, uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. So uh, the Nobel Prize said it was for the invention of an imaging semiconductor circuit, the CCD sensor. And, uh, you know, I was almost right. Smith and Boyle invented the CCD. But uh, the actual image sensor was uh, invented by a guy named Mike Thompson, who worked in their laboratory. And uh, while Smith and Boyle should get the, CC the uh, Nobel Prize for the CCD, it's unfortunate for Mike that the citation was written incorrectly. So uh, he felt a little bit, uh, um, uh, yeah, ignored. <clears throat> but he got a, uh, a makeup prize in uh, 2010. So uh, he felt a little better. Okay, so uh, anyway, so we have the CCD device and uh, it's used in lots of places. Uh, certainly uh, the Japanese perfected this technology and put it into camcorders and if you uh, were around in those days, you may remember that camcorders were big and they had big batteries on the back the size of a brick and they would only last for maybe an hour or so. Um, for uh, scientific sensing, the cameras were even bigger. Uh, here you can see uh, the Cassini spacecraft that uh, is still at Saturn today. Uh, and the camera is this big refrigerator sized thing on the side. These are people down here at the bottom, by the way. So this is a giant spacecraft. Um, and this big camera consumed a lot of power and had a lot of mass. And it uh, delivered one megapixel of data per frame. It's still up there today taking pictures, although I understand it's gonna be deorbited uh, very soon. So uh, this was a big problem for NASA, these giant spacecraft. Um, and they were thinking that, and why is it a problem? Because it takes a long time to budget these things and then get them built, and then uh, not to mention the long time it takes to get to some place like Saturn. So the new uh, NASA administrator uh, said, you know what, we need to be faster, better, cheaper, and we need to miniaturize the whole, everything, the rockets, the instruments, everything. 
And at that time I uh, came to JPL and uh, so my job was to miniaturize the cameras uh, on these uh, spacecraft. Well, if you're gonna miniaturize an electronic system, uh, most electronics engineers know that what you need to do is just integrate all the electronics on a, a single chip. But the problem uh, with doing that was that the image quality for the way people had done it in the past, like Peter Noble, is that the image quality was too poor. There was too much uh, noise and some other things. So uh, the real problem is, well, how can we build a good image sensor in something that's compatible with mainstream electronics technology uh, that will still give good image quality? And that was kind of, that was the statement of the problem in a way. So I was like, okay, uh, if we go to the uh, supermarket and we want to buy something uh, from the deli counter, for example, um, if you're at a good deli, they, uh, they take the plastic container probably and uh, they put it on the scale and then they zero out the scale and then they add whatever it is you're buying and then they weigh it a second time. And of course that new weight is the, uh, just measures the uh, material or the food that you bought, not including the container. So we basically use the same idea here inside every pixel. Uh, we uh, get uh, the light into the pixel and it generates electrons. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then we wanna weigh the electrons on a capacitor. And uh, for those of you that are on the electrical engineering side, you know that the change in voltage on a capacitor is just proportional to the charge that changes on the capacitor. So uh, what we do is we uh, set the uh, capacitor to a known voltage, and then we measure that voltage, that's like weighing the empty container, and then we transfer the electrons to the capacitor, um, so-called intrapixel charge transfer, transfer the electrons to the, the deli scale, if you will, uh, and measure the new voltage that comes out. And it's the difference of these two voltages that gives us a very accurate measurement of the charge. It's not really a complicated idea, um, um, but it turns out it was a new idea and it, uh, it worked quite well. I'll confess that originally I thought it was, uh, especially now that the patent's about expired, I didn't think it was like a great idea. I thought it was a pretty simple idea. Um, wasn't gonna file a patent, and, uh, but I was urged to do that and fortunately uh, we did. So, um, <clears throat> Anyway, here's a couple of other uh, science things that are going on. We talked about uh, light creating electrons of charge in the silicon. And simply that's just uh, shown up here that if we have uh, silicon, it's a uh, covalently bonded uh, solid. And if a, a photon of energy comes into the silicon, we can break one of these bonds give enough energy to the electron so it is free to wander around, and we leave behind a broken bond, which sometimes we call a hole. And so basically, one photon can generate an electron hole pair. And by the way, it doesn't, at least in the visible light range, no matter what the wavelength is, we get one electron hole pair for every photon. Now in the uh, semiconductor, we also know that uh, we can uh, dope the semiconductor, and that is put in a uh, fixed charge that can, through Gauss's law, uh, create a uh, electrostatic potential, and by tailoring the doping in the semiconductor, which I know is uh, complicated, but uh, anyway, uh, you can actually create sort of a, a potential, energy potential swimming well for electrons that has exactly the shape that you want. And so when an electron is generated uh, in the semiconductor, it wanders to the bottom of the swimming pool and just stays there. And so we can basically collect all the electrons at the bottom of the pool, and then they're ready for a readout at some point in the future. This uh, particular structure uh, is called the pinned photodiode, and it was invented by uh, Nobu Teranishi in 1982 during that period when the Japanese were really uh, developing uh, CCDs for consumer applications. And so this is what it looks like in uh, cross section and this is this SW storage well area is the bottom of the swimming pool. So a photon might come in, 
generate an electron. An electron flows to the bottom of the swimming pool. It waits here until we're ready for readout. And the way we read it out is we pulse the uh, uh, transfer gate here, uh, this uh, MOSFET. And it actually, by uh, applying a positive voltage to this transfer gate, it pulls the electron out of the storage well over to where uh, we can measure how much charge comes out, this uh, thing called a uh, floating diffusion. <clears throat> so once we uh, figure out that we can do this intrapixel charge transfer and get rid of the noise, we can start thinking about integrating lots of other things on this chip. So here we have an array of uh, pixels. Some are covered with the green filter, some with the red filter, and some with the blue filter. That's how we get color out of these uh, image sensors. Uh, and each one has its own little amplifier. And then we decide we're gonna read out this row. So we select the row, and all the voltages come down from these pixels to some analog signal processing circuitry, and then we convert it to a digital signal that can be read by a, a computer. And we can provide, do additional digital signal processing on that digital data, and then send it off the chip. So if you do all that, you get a chip that's got an array of pixels on it that are the light sensitive elements, analog signal processing and A to D converters and digital logic. And this whole thing we call a camera on a chip. Why is that? Because this is what the technology was at that time for the CCD camera. Here's the CCD chip, which is not very big. It's pretty compact. But the problem is, is that all these other electronics that we've put onto the camera on a chip had to be before on a, a separate boards or multiple boards in order to make that camera work. So while the CCD wasn't very big by itself, it's all that ancillary electronics that made cameras big. So when uh, we put all this onto a camera on a chip, we can actually build a very tiny camera module. Uh, this one actually even has autofocus built into it. Um, which really made what these uh, cell phone cam made these cell phone cameras possible. So I didn't do this by myself. I always like to uh, show off my team at uh, JPL. All these people made uh, important contributions, and it's always important to know that uh, it takes a team to do things. Now, uh, so we had this new technology, and it actually solved uh, NASA's problem, I thought. Um, but then it was like, oh, we can make really tiny cameras using this technology. And not only that, right now, at least in the United States, all our cameras were coming from Japan. It was like, hey, here's a great way for U.S. industry to benefit from this taxpayer-sponsored research at a federal laboratory. So I went around to all these electronics companies in the U.S. and told them about this new technology, and uh, they sort of said, huh. Well, that's interesting. Maybe we'll look at it one of these days. And uh, that went on for a year or two, and I got very frustrated, uh, as did the uh, other members of my team. And we said, you know what? We are just going to start our own company. If they're not going to do it, we'll do it. So uh, we founded this company called uh, Photobit Corporation in 1995 uh, to try to commercialize this technology. Now. You know, most engineers think that uh, doing a startup is just like any other kind of engineering. You just make a plan, you execute the plan, and uh, everything is hunky-dory. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out for uh, all of us that uh, luck is a very, very important part of uh, any startup. You talk to any successful entrepreneur and you ask them how it went, they'll always tell you that, oh yeah, luck had a big part of it. Uh, and if you talk to entrepreneurs, their company was not successful, they'll tell you they had bad luck. And it's really true. So this is not something, all of you engineers or faculty members out there that are thinking about doing startup companies, uh, you need to hope for good luck. Okay. Uh, in our case, uh, the good luck came in the form of a reporter who came to visit um, my lab at JPL. Actually, he wasn't even going to visit my lab. He happened to have some extra time and... Someone said, oh, you should go down to uh, Eric Fossum's lab and see what they're doing. Well, he came down and he got very interested and uh, <clears throat> wound up writing a two-page article in Business Week uh, about this new technology. Um, 
And mind you, this is March 1995. This is just a few weeks after we started our company. In fact, when the article came out, I realized we didn't even have a phone number for our startup company, and that was pretty embarrassing. Um, so I got a phone right away that day. Uh, but anyway, that helped uh, get the uh, company started. Um, and you know, uh, last night we heard uh, Alistair Humphreys give a talk about his uh, bicycle trip around the world. And, uh, you know, it was a fascinating story. And, uh, you know, he just focused on a couple of key steps in his, or key places he went to and things that happened. And someone in the audience said, what about all the rest of the stuff? And he said, well, you know, I realized after telling the same story many times that people don't care about all that other stuff that happened in between usually. So I'm just gonna tell you that from 1995 to 2001, there was a lot of that that happened. He thought of it, the perspiration phase. Uh, we grew the company um, up to about 135 people. Uh, of course, that meant getting a lot of design contracts and things. Actually, we didn't take any venture capital. Uh, we got very important support from the small business innovative research programs that were uh, managed by uh, NASA and uh, DOD. And then later, we got strategic uh, business partners also to uh, invest in the company. We filed about 100 additional patents in the company. Uh, got into uh, a number of products, including uh, webcams and dental x-ray sensors and swallowable pill cameras. And we knew that that uh, cell phone technology was right on the horizon. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was going to happen. And we also knew that as a company with uh, 100, even 135 people, is a lot of people, uh, it probably wouldn't be enough to really capture this market effectively. So uh, after some thought, we... Uh, uh, approached Micron Technology, and they uh, went ahead and acquired Photobit in uh, 2001. So, uh, well, that was a happy day, right? Um, and I stayed with Micron for uh, about another year. That wasn't so happy for me, um, because one day, essentially, you're the king of your company, and the next day, you're not. And uh, that's kind of hard to process sometimes, especially when somebody else is telling you what to do. So my advice to entrepreneurs, after you sell, exit, stage left. <clears throat> so, oh, by the way, here's the team around uh, 2000 or so. And like I said, we didn't do this all ourselves. There was a, a large team of people that made this uh, technology happen. So, uh, speaking of large teams, uh, the technology continued to be developed uh, around the world, uh, especially with the large market for cell phone cameras uh, emerging. In fact, uh, today there's about uh, 4 billion cameras four billion cameras manufactured every year that use this technology. Uh, so that works out to be 120 cameras per second. So you need to imagine a conveyor belt with 120 cameras per second coming off the end of the conveyor belt. It's like, wow. And you also have to imagine that most of those are uh, cell phone cameras and that in three years there's another conveyor belt with 120 20 cell phones per second going into landfill. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a big problem in electronics. Anyway, the sales were about uh, 10 billion in uh, 2016. And I just wanted to uh, emphasize that there are thousands of engineers that have worked and working on this technology around the globe. Uh, one good thing that happened uh, for Caltech, Caltech, by the way, manages JPL and uh, they wound up owning the uh, intellectual property that's developed there. And so Caltech, uh, after we sold our company, we had an exclusive license to the technology. After we sold our company, the technology license went back to uh, Caltech, and they uh, subsequently enforced their patents against all the major players. It's uh, been a huge win for uh, Caltech. And the other good news is NASA is now just adopting the technology for use in space. Uh, you may wonder what's happened in those 20 years. <clears throat> uh, and the answer is that uh, NASA is a very conservative organization. And if you're a scientist that is sending something to uh, the outer planets, and you're going to basically spend almost your entire career on this one project between uh, getting funding for it and then designing the instrument and putting it together and testing it and calibrating it and finally seeing it go on to a spacecraft and get launched and maybe six or seven years later it arrives at its destination and then you they're going to turn the power on to the camera. Um, 
you have to ask yourself, am I going to use a brand new technology that no one has flown in space before? Or am I going to use a technology that the last guy used and was proven to work well? So when your entire career is on the line, you tend to be conservative in your thinking. And uh, uh, unless there was, uh, you were constrained by space or size, um, you're going to go with the uh, technology you know that works. <clears throat> and this is also very important for uh, startup companies. Uh, so uh, in this case, the customer is the space science community. And down on Earth, you have other customers. And they also won't change their technology unless you have a compelling advantage. So it really has to be compelling. It can't just be a little bit better. It has to be greatly better. And so at least for the CMOS image sensor, especially when you think about cell phone cameras, it was great both from a size point of view and from a power point of view. And that's what uh, made it work so well. So uh, happy day. Uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Prize was announced, and it was uh, given to uh, four of us for uh, digital image sensors. Uh, myself, you just heard my story. Um, George Smith, who uh, invented that early CCD. Uh, Willard Boyle has passed away. Uh, Nobu Teranishi, who invented that pinned photo diode we talked about for uh, keeping the charge at the bottom of the uh, swimming pool. And then also Mike Thompson, who uh, missed out on the Nobel Prize. So it was, a, uh, it was a happy thing. This is actually a fake picture. Mike doesn't know actually how to take pictures with the cell phone. Um, but uh, so I actually took a picture. Here's the actual picture that we took uh, down here. And then uh, also uh, this is uh, Her Royal Highness uh, Princess Anne who we had a chance to meet. And as it turns out, um, we will go back someday when the, I mean someday this year, when uh, the queen decides it's time, and she has room in her schedule. She will invite us to Buckingham Palace, and we'll get the uh, actual prize at that time. But we don't know the date yet. OK, so uh, oh, here's a couple other things you might want to know about uh, CMOS image sensors. Uh, if you build chips, uh, you, uh, oops, you know that there is uh, wiring on the top of the chip. And the way we build the image sensor this, these days is we flip the chip over so the wiring is on the bottom. We grind down the back surface and polish it. And then we put color filters, those red, green, blue filters here, and then the little micro lenses to make sure the light goes into uh, the pixel. And then this, uh, this is the silicon material that absorbs the light. And so it's, uh, we call this a backside illuminated sensor. This is what's in your cell phone. Uh, there's been another breakthrough as well uh, for uh, these devices, and that is that we can build uh, one chip that has the pixels on it and another chip that has the readout electronics and other digital signal processing electronics. And through a new process called wafer bonding, uh, it's a new old process actually, but it's uh, been modernized to the point where we can have these connections between one chip and the other chip, kind of a sandwich. Uh, on a very tight pitch level, uh, typically less than five micron pitch. So we have very high density interconnect between the two chips. And that lets us optimize this chip for photo detection, and then we can optimize this chip for digital signal processing. So I always like to pause at this point in the talk and just say that, you know, as a technologist, uh, when we invent new technology, we don't always see all the things that are uh, going to come out of the technology. So um, here's a couple things uh, that I knew and that I didn't know. So uh, certainly I knew that we were going to we could use this for mobile cameras. I didn't really think about how much people would be using the technology to take selfies, pictures of themselves. Uh, it's kind of a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, <laughs> selfie sticks is a whole industry in selfie sticks now, uh, which is pretty funny. Um, it's on the light side. Uh, actually, another thing that uh, concerns me uh, is that uh, is what I call visual overload, that uh, we see so many images that we wouldn't normally see uh, without this technology. And, you know, I'm not exactly sure that the human psyche uh, evolved to the point that we could take in so much stress uh, from seeing all these images from around the world constantly and constantly being bombarded by them. So that was kind of an unintended uh, consequence. 
Certainly things like uh, body cameras for police didn't expect. I did always thought about the uh, uh, tension between security and privacy. And uh, I think generally speaking, none of us are really comfortable with having someone watching us all the time. Uh, on the other hand, when there is a, a tragedy, like this is the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, the fact that they were able to uh, catch the uh, culprits so quickly had to do with the fact that there were so many cameras out there and uh, they, they were caught on uh, many different cameras and tracked down. Uh, and then the last one is an inappropriate use by uh, teenagers in particular. Uh, who would have guessed that that would be a problem? Okay, so that's CMOS image sensors. I want to just move on now to uh, the uh, Quanta image sensor technology, which is uh, the next thing, my new music, so to speak. <clears throat> so uh, just a couple other scientific things. There's this thing called the uh, light wave particle duality, and I've already mentioned that uh, light acts like a wave, electromagnetic wave, uh, and it can uh, also uh, interfere with itself if you put two ocean waves or two light waves through a, uh, a slit, like here. Uh, the two waves uh, spread out after they go through the slit and they can start to interfere with each other and you wind up with light and dark uh, areas if you uh, expose a piece of film to this wave. Now the other interesting thing though happens is if you take a piece, this piece of film and you just really underexpose it or don't expose it for very long, um, <clears throat> What you find is that you don't get kind of a continuum in uh, exposure. You get uh, just dots of light, dots that are exposed. And if you increase the exposure, eventually the pattern, this interference pattern, starts to become clear to you. And this is because of the particle nature of light that it acts like a, a little bullet of energy. Uh, and uh, in a camera, as I mentioned, it, you use both things. You use the wave nature of light with the lens to, uh, to focus the image. And then we also use the fact that light acts like a particle sometimes to uh, interact with the silicon, that photon that comes into it. Here's another interesting thing, um, that if you take a, a perfect point of light, like a star, and you go through a perfect lens and create an image, you don't get a perfect image of the star. You, in fact, get this uh, diffraction pattern here, or airy disk, it's called sometimes. Um, so you start with a very perfect point of light, and you wind up with spread out light. And that amount of spreading depends on the wavelength that's used, as well as the uh, way the lens is designed. And it's actually pretty big. If you look at um, a lens that might be in a cell phone camera, and you look at green light, say, you find out that this center disk, this airy disk, might be three or four microns in diameter. That seems pretty small, but your cell phone camera uses pixels that are about one and a half microns in pitch. So it's already impossible to get a perfect image with your cell phone camera because we're, those pixels are below the diffraction limit. And that's just uh, pretty much fundamental physics, give or take some tricks that you can do. So uh, as we said, photons are quanta of energy. And it was like, I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if you could count those photons one at a time as they came into the chip? So I thought, okay, uh, let's take advantage of the uh, shrinking pixel size. Pixels get smaller and smaller every year. Um, and let's make a tiny specialized pixel um, which can uh, sense a single photoelectron and for reasons that'll become clear, we had to give this a different name, so we called it a jot, which comes from the Greek word iota, which means smallest thing. Uh, so the smallest thing is gonna sense a single electron. And then we're gonna read out all these jots or pixels at a very high frame rate, uh, because once pixels hit, we, uh, we're, we've sensed it, so we can't have more coming in. So we have to read it out pretty fast before it gets hit a second time. Um, and then uh, we're going to actually create image pixels by combining data from these jots over uh, spatial and temporal region using image processing. So uh, the vision is that maybe on a chip we have a billion of these photo detectors um, operating that are read out a thousand times per second and each one is sensitive to a single uh, photon. 
And if you just multiply a billion by a thousand, you get a terabit per second of data, which is a very big number. Okay. Uh, and by the way, we want to build a chip that does all of this and only consume less than one watt of power. So did I mention I'm back at Dartmouth? And this is like a perfect university research project, right? Practically impossible, but really interesting to contemplate. So uh, that's what we've been working on for the last couple of years. Just to make it clear, the paradigm shift is that we're going to go from counting these uh, buckets that fill up continuously to counting uh, individual uh, photons or individual raindrops across our hypothetical football field. So uh, in a cartoon sort of way, we have this uh, ones and zeros that are collected by the uh, jots, and they are part of an image, and we're going to combine these uh, ones and zeros over some local neighborhood, both in space and in time. So that's what we call this cubicle here, space and time, kind of a kernel. And, uh, and then we'll combine them all to create uh, grayscale uh, pixels. That's the main idea. So all we have to do is count photons, and we have to build chips that uh, can read this out a thousand times per second. Here's another uh, important thing uh, about uh, photons, is that unfortunately photons don't behave like the steady drip drip of a faucet, okay? Uh, they're more like traffic on the highway. And uh, so you get bunches of photons in some uh, dead spaces. And so if you make a measurement, let's say you measure some interval of time, and uh, if it were perfectly spaced, you'd read out three photons. Um, but because of the uh, variation in spacing, one time you measure it, you could get two. Uh, if you measure it another time, you might get four, or you might get the right answer sometime. And so you, got this, you have this constant variation in the uh, signal that you read out. It's like trying to, again, estimate traffic flow on a highway. If you do it over too short of an interval, you're going to get a very different number every time you try to measure it. So uh, this gives you a, uh, we call noise in our uh, measurement. And you can see this in your uh, camera at home. If you take a, uh, a photograph under uh, lower light conditions, and here's uh, this hearth here, and if you blow it up, you'll see, I think you can see that every single pixel is a slightly different uh, intensity level. And uh, you can also plot that out and see that there's quite a distribution of uh, pixel levels. And this has to do with this fact that every time we make the measurement, even though on average it should be the same, every measurement is just a little bit different. You know, it's annoying to have that in your photograph. We would like to get rid of it if we can, but it's pretty fundamental. So, uh, okay, and I should warn you that in the next five minutes before I end or so, we're going to take a little deeper technical dive. Um, <clears throat> This is the deepest dive right here. Um, there's an equation. I'll try not to use too many equations. So anyway, uh, if you, uh, it, it, well, anyways, it turns out that the arrival rate variation is well described by a Poisson process, uh, which has been known for hundreds of years, or hundred at least years. Uh, so, uh, and there's a formula that uh, Mr. Poisson wrote down to uh, explain this. And basically, uh, if you look at the number of photons that might come in, you'll see that sometimes you might get one, sometimes you might get two, sometimes you might get three, and a lot of times you might get zero. But on average, this would be one, one on average. And we call that the quanta exposure, H. And so for our jots, we only care about two things. One is, is it a zero, or was there more than zero that came in? And then we have a very simple equation for what the probability is that we have more than one photon. So uh, if we take a look at that equation, one minus e to the minus h, uh, as a function of the exposure, you'll see that at first it's, it's pretty linear, um, but then as it starts getting larger and larger, all the way up to the point where there's an average of one photon per jot across the array, you know intuitively, especially if it rains from time to time, looking at the ground, sometimes one jot gets hit more than once and other jots don't get hit at all. So even though on average there's one, 
the number of jot, the density of jots that have been hit by at least one photon is only 60 something percent. And then it rises asymptotically up to uh, 100 percent. So that's kind of interesting that we have this thing called overexposure latitude that even though it should be completely exposed at this point, in fact, there's still some wiggle room to get more contrast out of our image. If we take the same data and we plot, plot it but now on a log axis, on the horizontal axis, we get this uh, S-shaped curve called D log H. And we have, this is actually the linear region down here for a sparse illumination, and then we have the overexposure region up here. Now, um, I was lucky. I had one reference in this uh, talk already to something that's a thousand years old, uh, and it's not often you can reference a published paper that is uh, more than a hundred years old, but in this case, uh, here is a plot made by uh, Herter and Driftfield in 1890 and published and they looked at film density on uh, plates for a photographic film as a function of uh, exposure, log exposure, and uh, pretty obvious, it's like the same curve. Why is that? Because a photographic plate is made up of lots of uh, silver halide grains of film, and if they hit, I'm gonna simplify this a little bit, but if they get hit by a photon, when you develop the, uh, the plate, that, uh, silver halide grain gets washed away in the developer. If it doesn't get hit, it stays behind. Uh, so basically, it's the same problem. What's the probability that a grain of film or a grain of silver halide gets hit by a photon or not in a given exposure time? And so the physics or statistics are exactly the same, and it's not surprising that uh, the curve also looks the same. So this is pretty interesting. So now we have a solid state image sensor technology, at least a candidate for one, that's gonna behave a lot like film. And it turns out this makes photographers really excited because most of them hate the digital capture uh, quality or tonal qualities. Uh, they love digital image sensors, but they don't like the tonal quality that you get. So this is like, oh, we get lots of exposure latitude. Same thing with cinematographers, they also like this. Uh, so anyway, we we're uh, trying to make this uh, device at uh, Dartmouth. We have lots of things to worry about. We have to worry about the device and how to read it out without melting down. Just to remind you, uh, we're looking for uh, like a, the ability to go to maybe a terabit per second data rate at uh, a watt or less. So we made some good progress against these goals thanks to my uh, students, my group at uh, Dartmouth. It's not a very big group. And uh, I have to be honest with you, it was a little bit of a shock to go from running a big lab with a lot of PhDs, and like hundreds of PhDs, to back to the university where I've got uh, five students that uh, don't know anything. Uh, so uh, I really have to give them a huge amount of credit for coming up the learning curve and being able to actually produce stuff. It's, uh, it's really to their, uh, their credit. So uh, one of the things also that I said that we had to achieve uh, especially for this JOT device, is that we have to be able to make it. I mean, it would be one thing to kind of conceive of it, but if we want to like actually get it into the hands of users, we need a fabrication process that kind of already exists. We can't just start from scratch because there's too much of a barrier to get that into uh, uh, production. So we want to make sure it was not too difficult to fabricate in a CMOS image sensor. That's what CIS means, CMOS image sensor fabrication line. Uh, so, uh, one of my students, J.J. Ma and myself, we invented this uh, pump gate uh, jot, uh, which I won't go through the details here, but the main thing is that we were able to build a really tiny capacitor. So remember that the change in voltage on a capacitor depends both on the size of the capacitor and the charge that you move there. So if we want a big voltage signal by putting one electron there, we better make that capacitor really tiny. So the trick was how to make a really tiny capacitor. And so we kind of figured out how to do that and how to get the electron moved over to that deli scale at the time that we want to make the measurement. Uh, and if you make this really tiny capacitor, here's something that is electrical engineering 101. I told you, you put a charge on a capacitor, you should get a change in voltage. 
So we made a really tiny capacitor and uh, we let light shine on this uh, device and we see very clear steps as the voltage changes uh, due to each photoelectron being integrated on that uh, capacitor. You know, this is something that you would think you'd see in an electrical engineering 101 textbook somewhere, but uh, I guess uh, maybe we're one of the first to be able to show this. So um, this is like really cool, okay, except it's really technical. <laughs> so uh, I want to say that uh, if we look at the voltage coming out of the amplifier from a pixel, uh, let's just read out that pixel uh, 20,000 times and we'll just rate, measure the voltage coming out under constant illumination. And you know we should get the same voltage out each time. That's what we would expect. But if we make a histogram, uh, what we see is that, uh, don't worry about the units down here, this is voltage basically, that uh, a lot of times we get uh, this value out and then there's a dip and then uh, this value out, also pretty high probability, and then lower probability for each of these, or lower occurrence rate for uh, each of these higher uh, voltage levels. If we turn the light up a little bit more, we get a different set of peaks, uh, and the higher the peaks are moved out and moved out even farther. And what this is saying is that the voltage that is coming out of our amplifier is very quantized. Okay, it's not just a continuum of different voltages. It's either corresponds to either zero electrons on that capacitor, one, two, three, four electrons. And the height of these peaks is exactly what you would predict from that Poisson distribution. So as you increase the exposure, the Poisson distribution shifts and these peaks line up exactly with what we expect. So we're really counting single photons of light, one at a time. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna skip this slide. I'll just say that uh, for those that care, the dark current is very low and the lag is also very low. We measured this D log H curve just to make sure it worked the way we thought it worked. And uh, experimentally, it uh, lines up uh, pretty much perfectly. Uh, and then uh, this is actually log H and log density now. And we expect to get a nice straight line. Um, and we do get that. By the way, this is what happens if the noise grows larger and larger. You get a big error. You should be reading something on this line, but you read a much higher value. So if you want to do photon counting for scientific applications like microscopy or astronomy, you really need to have this very low read noise with uh, photon counting capability. So we, uh, as I said, we implemented this chip. We did a, uh, an also special uh, readout electronics architecture where we uh, take a cluster of these jots and we three-dimensionally integrate it with the readout electronics. And there's a connection between each cluster and a set of readout electronics uh, and put this all together on a, uh, a chip. Uh, thanks to the uh, generosity of TSMC, I should mention. So we, uh, we built that chip um, without going through uh, all the details. Uh, I'll just say that, uh, and I'm sorry if JJ or Soleil sees this talk in the future, uh, I didn't actually think they would be able to make this chip work because it's a very complicated. It's more than 100,000, uh, I'm sorry, 100 million transistor chip um, in a new process, and we were working against a deadline, and they worked day and night for uh, right up to the deadline, and I figured the odds that they didn't make one single mistake, one transistor that's out of place, was uh, incredibly high. But uh, in fact, it, uh, it works, again, to their credit. Um, so uh, here's uh, kind of the proof is in the pudding kind of slide. We took a, a target scene, which happens to be a leopard, um, printed it on a piece of paper, pointed the camera at that target under very weak light, 
And this is just one field that we collected of data of ones and zeros. Of course, if you're sitting, actually I can't even see the individual dots from where I am, and you can never display them anywhere with this projector. But these are a lot of uh, black dots and white dots representing ones and zeros in the uh, uh, photon counting in the field. And that's one field at, uh, from a, grabbed from 1,000 fields per second. If we do that summing operation, uh, an eight by eight by eight cubicle, we get, these probably all look the same to you sitting back there, but uh, we get some grayscale restored. And then with some additional uh, reconstruction algorithm, we get a very nice uh, smooth image, almost uh, uh, indistinguishable from the original image, except for some uh, fixed pattern noise streaks through this uh, image. So uh, we're doing photon counting. Uh, if you're in this field, you'll know that this is uh, pretty advanced. Uh, we're doing photon counting with a mega jot or megapixel array at 1,000 uh, frames per second. Uh, we're not using any avalanche multiplication. We're at room temperature. And we're reading it out uh, for a total uh, consumption of about uh, 18 milliwatts total, including all the pads. So it's a, uh, it's a very nice result, and we'll be uh, publishing this formally in the future. Again, credit to J.J. Uh, Ma and Soleil Masudim. So anyway, we got pretty close. Actually, these, uh, this is kind of a bar graph of how far I think we've gotten on these different things that have to come together. We're pretty far along on the jots. We're far along on the readout. And uh, right now, uh, the uh, sky's limit for uh, on-ship uh, processing of the data. Uh, everybody I talk to in the computer science uh, community is pretty excited about this because it gives them that raw photon field data right from the very beginning, and they can do uh, all kinds of uh, imaging. Okay, so uh, I think I mentioned that, uh, or maybe it's obvious, the uh, applications for this uh, photography and cinematography and uh, scientific sensors and uh, even a quantum random number generator. And this was something I heard somebody else say, but it was a, a great quote which is um, you don't necessarily find killer applications when you're a startup company, um, but often they'll come find you. So uh, I'm looking forward to that day as well. Speaking of which, so we decided, oh, it works, let's start a company. So uh, just a few, uh, feels like a few weeks ago, we uh, spun off a company called Gigajot, and uh, I tried to make my role as small as possible. It should be really small down here because I have no time whatsoever. So uh, mostly this will be uh, Soleil and, uh, and JJ who uh, lead this company. So with that, I'd like to uh, end my talk and thank you for your attention. <laughs>